imagine what the oceans were like 150 years ago. We don't have films. In fact, even Jacques Cousteau wasn't there then. And so we need to use proxies, um, like art collections. One art collection we have that I'm fortunate enough to be the curator of is the Blaschka Glass Invertebrate Collection. Um, this is a collection of over 570 pieces you. of glass that were made 150 years ago that give us a chance to see close up what some of the common marine critters were in the oceans of 150 years ago. So today, using this time capsule, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this collection, um, explain to you some of the watercolors that the Blaschkas produced first uh, before doing each of their glass pieces, um, and then fast forward to our quest to do a film that will actually bring some of these creatures to life by going back in the oceans and looking for the living representatives so that you can see how they behave and what sorts of um, activities they have in the oceans. Now, um, the Blaschka Art Collection is a bridge and it connects us, the biodiversity of 1860 oceans to the biodiversity of today's oceans. And one of the questions we have is how many will still be in today's oceans when we go back and look? Well, how did I come to this quest? Um, well, this is kind of my job. I'm a marine biologist. As a, gr as a younger, quite a few years ago, graduate student, um, I was able to, um, to actually participate in saturation diving missions where we lived for a week underwater um, in an underwater laboratory in the Caribbean. And that was kind of something that inspired really my whole career um, that I've been able to continue. And even recently, this is uh, me on Palmyra Atoll. This is an atoll in the middle of the Pacific. And I was invited by the Nature Conservancy to participate in a project that explores um, ways of creating more health across the Pacific for some of our invertebrates there. Let me just introduce the glass workers to you. The Blaschkas are a father-son team, were a father-son team. Um, this is Leopold Blaschka, the father on top, and his son, Rudolf. And um, uh, Le Leopold was a glass worker, so he actually was making prosthetic eyes. Um, and he went on an ocean voyage, and he became becalmed in the middle of the sea. And it gave him a chance to kind of look look over the side of the, the boat and sort of see some of the common critters that were in the ocean there. And as an artist, um, he was creating, drawing watercolors and suddenly realized he could create these in glass. And so that kind of began his quest uh, to create all of these amazing creatures in glass. And that's what I want to show you a little bit about. You know, before this, when I was asked, um, who would you most want to spend an evening with or, or some time with? I totally picked Leopold, um, just because um, I'm just so enamored of the, his obsessive attention to detail and inspiration for these creatures, and then also the way he worked with his son. I really love the fact um, that one of the comments he makes is um, that tact increases with each generation, and it's just a really nice, nice image for me about them. Um, our collection has over 570 pieces. It was ordered in 1885 by then Professor of Cornell, A.D. White. Uh, we have approximately 200 pieces currently on display and we're continuing to restore more. Now, like the oceans themselves, our collection um, has certainly had some hard times and there's a fair amount of restoration uh, that's required and uh, we need the magist uh, the magic and the artistry of Elizabeth Brill to actually restore some of these pieces uh, to their former luster. So the, here's an example of what a piece looks like sort of sitting in our boxes um, before re restoration um, and then after she finishes it. Now these are all, of course, what I'm about to show you are all made of glass. Um, and this is kind of a it's kind of a family tree or a tree of life of the invertebrates are all the ones that we have represented here. So we start with kind of the basal things like the anemones and the, and the um, uh, uh, jellyfish shown there, the sea slugs, um, and then on up to the cephalopods like the octopus and the squid. 
uh, and then finally to the to the mighty echinoderms. Now, my brother's an attorney, and he's very smart, but um, he doesn't know a lot of biology, so he didn't actually know what an invertebrate was. So it's possible that there are people in the audience here also that don't know what invertebrates are. So I just, this is what I do. I thought I'd take a minute to just explain. These are animals without backbones. Um, so they're not, fish are not invertebrates. It's just these guys here uh, that form uh, the invertebrates in our oceans. And really, they kind of dominate and control the oceans. They fix some of the carbon. They do a lot of energy cycle. They form the base, the middle, and the top of the food chains. These critters dominate uh, our oceans and the biology of our oceans. What I've chosen to do today, I want to just focus on a particular subset of that tree of life. And I want to talk about the cephalopods, uh, which uh, collectively make up, these are the octopus and the squids. And I've chosen these groups because they're just, they're so enchanting. Um, they're smart. They're really smart. I don't know. Have any of you ever kind of stared eye to eye with an octopus? OK. And you sort of feel like you've made eye contact, and they know you're there. Um, they're very fast, and they're important predators of the very deep oceans. They're also ancient. Um, they originated over 500 million years ago, so they're certainly a lot older than we are. Um, and, there's a, and they're a pretty species group. So this is an example of one of our pieces after it was restored. That was it kind of before it was restored. Um, you can see there's significant improvement. <laughs> um, one of the things I, that's really exciting to me about the collection is that in addition to our beautiful glass pieces, Corning Museum of Glass and the Ray Cal Library has um, almost 500 watercolors as well. So before the Blaschkas created each of these glass pieces, uh, they drew these testing watercolors, which in themselves are beautiful. Um, this is um, another piece. This is one of my favorite. This one is actually currently on display in Corning, if anybody's interested in that, this Chirotuthis veranii. Um, and one of the things about the glass is it allows you to see the pieces, but you can't see what they do. And so that's why we're really excited about going back and filming the living uh, marine invertebrates, so you can see what are they doing with those really long tentacles, and I'm going to show you in a minute. These are just a few others of our pieces I wanted to show you before I go on and um, show you how we're planning to bring them to life. Um, this is a uh, one of the watercolors of a sea slug, and this is a critter that I found in a tide pool in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm going to just show you how it's advancing on its um, uh, sea anemone prey. So here's one of these nudibranchs coming to life now. And it actually eats anemones. And you'll see that as soon as it touches the anemone, the anemone realizes this is bad news. I am in trouble. <laughs> so the idea is to be able to go with all of these critters and show you what they actually do in nature. Um, this is David Brown. He's actually here in the audience, somewhere over there. And he's a videographer and a filmmaker, and he's very excited about working on this project with me to bring these animals to life. And so I'm going to show you, sort of, David asks me to remind you, this is a very simple version of sort of watching the glass transform into one of the living invertebrates. So this is one of our glass pieces. Um, and what you can see is that with a little bit more artistry, we'll be able to bring them bring them to merge in with the living, the living marine critters. This is a film that David um, and, well, David made of me as we were looking for some of the giant sea anemones in the Pacific Northwest. I'll just show you a little bit of this. Um. So this is me in the San Juan Islands. Uh, David made me go in this really cold, dark water uh, looking for these beautiful sea anemones. Um, this is a sea cucumber we also found on that dive. Uh, and then more of these uh, sea slugs and jellyfish. And we didn't see a lot of cephalopods on that dive, but Bruce Robeson at Mabari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, uh, was ha generous enough to let me show these um, 
films. And so I thought you'd like to see how some of the deep water squid uh, watch this fish. There's the tentacles, okay? So that's what they do with those long tentacles. Um, these are fierce, fast predators in the ocean. Um, they also engage in a lot of behaviors like this inking for cloaking so that they can slip away and hide before uh, the fish find them. Gives you a sense of, you know, the incredible, okay, there it is. So that's how they sit and wait, waiting for the fish to come by with those long tentacles and then shoot them out five times the length of their body uh, to nail their prey. Um, again, just some of these amazing squid kind of cloaking themselves, sitting quietly. These are all deep water squids, so these are folk, these are filmed off Monterey Bay Aquarium off the coast of California. Um, and those eyes, always the eyes watching. Uh, and it amazes me how still they can be for something that moves so fast. Now what you're gonna see next is some footage just off the coast of Maine, so a fairly common location. This is footage that David shot of this pod of squids, so this social group that was out foraging. Uh, this was shot at night, so he was out with his video camera. Now it may look like he's following them, but actually they are following him uh, around. Um, you know, just enchanting, and this is, these are common animals um, found frequently at this location. This gives you a sense of how they're moving through the oceans. And our goal, of course, is to go back and find many more of these creatures and incorporate it into a more comprehensive film. Um, so as I'm ending up here, I want to take a minute to think about the fact that the oceans have also changed a lot in the last 150 years. And one of the things that's changed a lot um, or that's, that's fueled some of that change is the increasing carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And um, Art just told you a little bit about that, so you've already seen this Keeling curve. Um, does anybody know what level we're at right now in terms of the parts per million CO2? I think I heard somebody say 392. It's somewhere between 392, 395 right now. Um, and we have no reason to think it's not going to keep doing this. Um, so there's no current activity um, to curb those CO2 emissions. Um, but I think that um, you need to understand that, in a, that CO2, 30% uh, of it is absorbed by the oceans and has direct chemical effects. It's creating more acidi acidified conditions within the oceans. Um, we've had over a 30% change in the acidity of the oceans on average in the last 150 years. And, um, of course, you understand that's just an average. In some locations, it's a much larger change. Um, so, for example, in upwelling areas where we were diving with those sea anemones, uh, the acidity can be doubled um, and a pH of 7.8 can be corrosive. So, for example, in the Pacific Northwest now, there are locations where shellfish like oysters can't even metamorphose, metamorphose from their larval stage. And there have been mass mortalities within the hatcheries, actually causing some of the hatcheries to relocate to other areas. So these are impacts that are already being felt in today's oceans. Um, so I think we might think about ways uh, to change the trajectory of this curve. And then maybe we'd have a more positive future for our oceans um, and the planet. The point, of course, of this film is to go back and see whether the changes in the ocean have caused changes in the biodiversity of some of these critters. So I want to end by just reminding you, hopefully this is an idea worth spreading, that both marine biodiversity and the Blaschka's glass menagerie are fragile. Thank you.